Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, dear respected brothers and sisters, and welcome to another episode of Live in London with Dr. Sayyid Amman Nakshwani. Tonight's topic is the topic of Imamat. Now, Imamat in English is leadership, roughly translated to leadership. Imamat is a fundamental and big pillar of the Shi'i belief system. Twelve Imams revered by millions, yet many questions and misconceptions arise around this topic. For example, are the Imams within the Shia school infallible? If so, to what level? To what level were their knowledge? Did they have knowledge of the unseen? Is Imam at a political stance or was it mentioned during the life of the Holy Prophet? Or was it ar arisen after the death of the Holy Prophet? These are questions that we'll be looking to answer in tonight's show, inshallah, with our esteemed guest, Dr. Sayyid Amman Akshwani. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as Very nice wa rahmatullah. To have you on our show again. Thank I'm you. Thank blessed. you so much. Pleasure to be here. Sayyidna, the difference between the Sunni and Shia split is mainly centered around the issue of Imamat. Would you be kind enough to elaborate on the topic for us tonight? I don't think it's mainly centered around the issue of Imamat. I think the main differences between the Shia school and other schools within the religion of Islam is two major epistemological differences that need to be understood. Because I've seen many people email me questions recently about proving imama and the belief in imama. And I think many of them have not understood the worldview of the school of Ahlul Bayt in contrast to other worldviews. Before you discuss Imama, or you discuss Nubuwa, or you even discuss the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's two epistemological issues, two theories of knowledge that we all need to understand very clearly. The first of them is the fact of looking at where we're getting our knowledge from about the religion of Islam. Where I get my knowledge from in the school of Ahlul Bayt is completely different from other schools in the religion of Islam. When a person asks me to prove imama as a belief, where I'm getting the sources of my knowledge in order to understand the position of the imams or to understand the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because naturally that's going to be fundamental in understanding whether he has made an announcement in relation to a designation about authority after he passes away, where I get my knowledge about the fundamental principles of the religion of Islam is from the likes of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, from Imam al Hassan السلام, Fatima al Zahra السلام, from Imam al Hussein السلام, Imam Zain al Abidin, Imam al Baqir, and Imam al Sadiq. Imam al Sadiq for me, as a Shi'i and a follower of the school of Ahlul Bayt, he has thousands of narrations that explain to me God, that explain to me prophethood, that explain to me imama, that explain to me the meaning of the day of judgment. If you look at our brothers and other schools in Islam, you'll be hard pressed to find a hundred narrations from someone like Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. I guarantee you that if you go to other schools in Islam, ask them about Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam you'll be lucky to get a hundred narrations from him. For me, I've got thousands of narrations from Imam al-Sadiq which means that when I'm coming to discuss any Islamic issue, my knowledge base is going to be from the likes of Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al-Baqir, Imam Zain al-Abidin and so on. My knowledge base is going to be from the Ahlul Bayt My istidlal and the proofs of how a verse, for example, of the Qur'an was revealed, why it was revealed, when it was revealed, is going to be from who? From the Ahlul Bayt My knowledge of every event in the life of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, is going to be from who? From the Ahlul Bayt I do not take my understanding of the Qur'an, or my understanding of God, or my understanding of the seerah, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, of his biography, I don't take it from where other schools in Islam may take it. For example, you've got Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah will take predominantly their understanding of the tafsir of the Holy Quran, which is pivotal when it comes to 
understanding our belief in God or in prophethood or for example the day of judgment or when we come to discuss Imama for example I'm not going to take my tafsir of the Holy Quran from Anas bin Malik. Mm. I don't have any reverence for Anas bin Malik whatsoever in my life. Nor would I take from Abdullah bin Umar. Nor would I take from Aisha. Nor would I take from Abu Huraira. Let's make this clear right from the beginning. Because just in case someone keeps coming and telling you, you Shia I can't prove to me your beliefs. I can. But my worldview, firstly, is that my source of knowledge are the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, number one. Number two, if I'm going to take knowledge from Sahaba, I'll take from Salman al-Muhammadi. I'll take from Abu Dhar al-Ghafari. I'll take from al-Miqdad. I'll take from, for example, Ammar bin Yasir. I'll take from Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari. I'll take from, let's say, Abdullah bin Mas'ud. And I'm being very specific with who I'm mentioning. That these are the people who, when I want to show a position in the school of Ahlul Bayt on a certain issue, these are the personalities I'm going to go to. I will not go to Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira for me is not an authority. I really don't care about a single thing Abu Huraira says. And this is not something to smile about. It's something because I'm seeing people out there today who are asking me, where do you get your knowledge from? Prove to me this belief. I don't take from Abu Huraira. I don't take from Aisha. I don't take from Abdullah bin Umar. And I don't take from Anas bin Malik. I may take from Ibn Abbas. That which does not contradict the school of Ahlul Bayt. I may take from Ibn Abbas. Yes, why not? But if a person expects me to discuss an issue in the school of Ahlul Bayt. And I'm saying that when you say to me the major difference between Sunni and Shia as Imam. No, it's not. Let's start all the way from the beginning. Our worldview and our understanding of Allah, who do I get it from? I get it from Ahlul Bayt. I'm not taking my understanding of God from Abu Huraira or from Anas bin Malik. These are not an authority for me. They can narrate thousands of traditions. None of those traditions will mean anything to me unless they are traditions which don't contradict what Imam al-Baqir or Imam al-Sadiq, the great grandsons of Rasulullah has said. That first epistemological point is fundamental. Because today when someone's trying to tell me prove this and prove that for me, and they're saying to me that they want me to prove it according to companions who have explained what is in the Quran and its revelations, or according to companions who are explain, explaining to me the seer of Rasulullah. No, I'm not. I'm not going to take from any of them, and I will not take from any of them. When I see some of our youths being cornered today on this issue of imamat and this constant point that's being made that the difference between Sunni and Shia is imam. No, it's not. My conception of God is different to yours. Mm -hmm. The way Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib talks about God, Abu Huraira and Anas and Abdullah bin Umar and Aisha, if they were all to come together, will not come near a line of Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, when he talks about God. My understanding of God of the attributes of essence, of the attributes of action, there is a clear difference between the understanding in the Sunni world and the Shia world. Yes, we all believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. And even if someone was to say to me, show me an ayah in the Quran that talks about Tawheed, I will. But even that ayah that talks about Tawheed will still be open to debate between different schools in Islam. That's why you'll find in Ahlul Sunnah, the Mu'tazila emerged. The Asha'ira emerged, different books of creeds have to be written to try and postulate a position about a certain belief and the different schools were differing over these beliefs. Also, my understanding of prophethood as well. My understanding of prophethood comes from who? From Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, from Imam al Hassan salam, from Imam al Hussein salam, from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, from their chosen companions. I'm not going to come and take my understanding of the seer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa from Abu Huraira who had an animosity towards Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. I'm not going to come and take it from Aisha who fought Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib at the Battle of Jamal. I'm not going to take it from Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab who remained silent knowing that the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was about to be massacred and did not even say a single word to support him. My understanding of Nubuwa is not coming from just the family of Rasulullah but it's coming from 
the mystical divine light that was in the loins of Ibrahim السلام, through Ismail all the way towards the Holy Prophet peace be upon him his family. So let's get that first point clear and it has to be made clear. That first epistemological point which I think many people are not understanding and that is that the source of knowledge in Shiism if you want to ask me, show me this here, yes, I'll show you. But according to Imam al-Baqir, Imam al-Sadiq, you want me to show you according to Abu Huraira and Anas bin Malik and Aisha and Abdullah bin Umar, I have no interest in any of their works or in any of their narrations. Let's make that clear from the beginning. Secondly, a second epistemological issue when it comes to the worldview of the school of Ahl al-Bayt, rationality is as important, if not more important, than text. I found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists because the Quran said He exists. Does God exist because the Quran said He, he exists? No, or is it because of what? Creations of Because of your rational inquiry. Because you're reflecting on the creation that surrounds you. I look around me and I think, well, if that's the effect, there must be a cause. I look and I think to myself, something cannot come out of nothing. Therefore, you find that when I look at a particular principle of belief, Ahlul Sunnah are saying to me, prove it to me, prove it to me from a worldview that is purely textual. I come from a school where the worldview places rationality at a fundamental level. Now, if you look at the Holy Quran, someone says, well, the Quran is saying, look at the text. I will look at the text. I cannot deny the naql in theology. But I'll also use the aql. In the Quran, in chapter 21, verse 22, Allah has already mentioned that He creates. Allah has mentioned that He is one. He is needless of the help of any. But likewise, Allah also tells us to reflect rationally. Do you agree? Yes. In the Quran, does not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Surah 21, verse 22, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهُ لَفَسَدَتَا If there were gods other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there would be corruption. If you say now there's more than one God, rationally, if you say there's more than one God, what's the rational, uh, what's the problems that will occur? Firstly, if one God makes the decision, does that mean the other God did not know about the decision? Does that mean that the other God was not capable of making that decision? Does that mean that that God that made the decision is more powerful than the other God that didn't make the decision? Does that mean that there's a God who's limited and is definable? And if he's limited and definable, cannot be called a God? The Quran wasn't just a work that told us look for textual analysis or it asks man to constantly be in a process of tadabbur, tafakkur, ta'aqqal, constant reflection, constant contemplation. Therefore, when I come to an understanding of a concept in Shi'ism, when someone tells me, prove this to me, prove this to me, prove this to me, show me it in Quran, show me it in Hadith, I'm like, wait, who told you Quran and Hadith for me have the primary position when it comes to understanding a concept? I understood Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not with my eyes, with my intellect. Do you agree? Yeah. I haven't seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but rationally, I led to a conclusion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. Even my belief in the Quran is not textual. Do you know why? Because it becomes circular. Do you believe the Quran is the word of God? Yes. Why? Because the Quran says it's the word of God. That's a circular argument. Mm. My belief in the Quran is the word of God. I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. He would not leave his creation without guidance. Therefore, he sometimes sends us guidance in the form of external guides, internal guides. An external guide may be, for example, a prophet or a book. And an internal guide, our intellect. Therefore, in the school of Ahlul Bayt, when you come to an issue like Imama, and our youth today, when someone comes up to them and says, prove to me imama, prove to me imama. You reply by saying, rationally, a man like the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, who would not leave his house without making sure that there's someone looking after it, who would not leave a city for a war without making sure there's someone who's protecting that city. Are you telling me that he would die and leave his whole ummah without having made clear who the leader is for them? Now, this is a rational argument. I can go towards text, but remember my first epistemological premise on Imama. And what is it? When I do go to the text, you have to take my, my sources mm -hmm. 
as the interpreters of knowledge. And I'm not just bringing any Tom, Dick and Harry. I'm not bringing ex-pagans as the people who are giving me knowledge. Mm. I'm bringing to you the people who in their time, the Imams of other schools of fiqh revered them as the greatest men of knowledge. As in when I say that I'm gonna give you the interpretation of that ayah from Imam al-Sadiq I don't think there's anyone out there who can deny the knowledge of Imam al-Sadiq But I, when I take my understanding of an ayah of the Quran or of a hadith and someone now comes to me and says, Sayyidina, prove to me Imam. I'll say, I'll prove to you Imam from Imam al-Bakr and Imam al-Sadiq. I'm not going to use Anas, nor Abu Huraira, nor Abdullah bin Umar, nor Aisha. I will not use them for the Quran, nor will I use them for the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I don't need them for the seerah of Rasulullah. The Quran and the seerah are fundamental. Because at the end of the day, when we're trying to understand anything that took place during the life of Rasulullah, any of his statements, any of his announcements, as a guidance for his ummah, we're going to need the Quran. And we're also going to need the seerah. Naturally, the seerah will allow us to understand his life, his biography. And we're going to need the books of tafsir. But, and this is for every one of you listening out there. When someone comes and tells you that make sure that you focus on showing me from here, from here. First, I'll show you our rational conclusion on this issue. Allah gave us an aql for a reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give a person an aql so that that person sits back and does not use it at all. Rather, we use that aql and also we look for the naqli evidences as well. Inshallah. You very beautifully explained the <laughs> rational you. and textual understanding. Uh, so I guess my next question would be, as you touched up on the, the Quran, where in the Quran would it be, uh, you know, would there be pointers if it is albeit just textual for us to better understand the, the issue or topic around the moment? Again, firstly, we said we've reached a rational understanding that in the same way, Hisham ibn, ibn al-Hakam explains this in a wonderful way, where he says if Allah created the heart as a guide for the senses, he would not leave behind a leader as a guide for mankind. Yes. Rationally, we understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no way that his prophet who looks after the affairs of all his community would leave the world without making sure that his community know who their authority is, especially when you look at after he passed away and the number of schisms that occurred, which we'll come to later. When you're coming to ask the question, I hear many people asking this question. I want you to show me Imamat, show me it textually, show me it from the Quran. Which part of Imamat did you want to see from the Quran? It's like a person saying to me, show me the whole understanding of prophethood in one ayah of the Holy Quran. Which part of prophethood do you want to understand? The mission of prophets? The infallibility of prophets? The knowledge of prophets? Because I can't find you an eye on the Holy Quran which gives me the understanding of the whole of prophethood in one. I could, there's no eye which says Al-Nabi, Al-Alim, Al-Ma'soom, Alim al -Ghay. There's no eye which tells me every single function or definition of Nabuwa. When I come therefore towards understanding Imama from the Holy Quran, which part of Imama do you want me to explain to you? Imama as a position which a prophet of Allah reached as his highest position, I can show you that. For example, in chapter 2 verse 1, 2, 4, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Nabi Ibrahim, after Nabi Ibrahim was a Nabi, a Rasul, reached the level of Khalil, Prophet, Messenger, Friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, high station. Then Imama, قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ imama. I have made you an Imam for the people. It shows that while he was a Nabi and a Rasul, Allah told him there's another station, a high station. And that is the station of being an Imam for the people as well. A leader for the people as well. One who's wholeheartedly sacrificing himself to guide people spiritually and politically and has the knowledge to be able to guide the people in all of their affairs. Now, that's one aspect of Imam. That it's an extremely high station, which the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not all of them, but you found that, for example, the Ulil Azam prophets, 
they reach that station of imamah. You see, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Khatam al-Nabiyyin, he is. Khatam al-Mursaleen, he is. Do we agree? Yes. No one's ever called him Khatam al aimah The seal of the prophets, we've heard him being called the seal of the prophets many times. When it comes to, for example, something like the seal of the messengers, we've heard that as well. When it comes to, for example, the seal of the imams, never heard that. Sayyid al aimah yes. But when it comes to seal of the imams, is that an indication that there were imams after? Let's leave it at that. Firstly, you have Nabi Ibrahim reaching the high stage of imam. Number two, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses an imam on earth. I'm not saying anything to do with the 12 imams. I'm saying imam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designates an imam, that it's a high position that prophets reach. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran mentions, I'm appointing you as an imam, O Ibrahim, for the people. Okay. Number three, likewise, those whose obedience is the same as the obedience of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that that is a, an extremely high level to reach. Many times in the Quran we hear the ayah, أَطِيعُ Allah wa أَطِيعُ Rasul. Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُ Allah wa أَطِيعُ Rasul. Oh you who believe, obey Allah, obey the Prophet. How many times? A number of times. Obey Allah, obey the Prophet. Obey Allah, obey the Prophet. In Surah 4 verse 59, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks that the obedience is extended. Hold on, Islam finishes with the Prophet Muhammad. Mm. Peace be upon him and his family. Islam ends with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Khatam of the Nabiyyin, Khatam of the Mar Mursaleen. But hold on. Islam ends with the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Why in Surah 4 verse 59 does Allah say, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ Obey Allah, we all agree, we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obey the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. Okay, Islam finishes with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. And obey those in authority from amongst you. Question, who explains to me this verse? What did we say earlier? Anas bin Malik, Abu Huraira, Aisha, Abdullah bin Umar. I have no interest in their explanation from now. Until someone puts me six feet under the ground, I will never, ever, ever, never have an interest in their explanation. My prophet said to me that he leaves behind two weighty things. Hold on to them and you'll never go astray. The Quran and my Ahlul Bayt. Do you agree? Of course. This is Sahih Muslim. It's not just in our works of literature. I'm quoting Muslim for polemical reasons. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's not authority for me. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, says to me, hold on, Quran and Bayt. When I go to Surah 4, verse 59 of the Holy Quran, when Imam al Baqir and Imam al Salih explain this ayah of the Quran, I don't think anyone can doubt their knowledge. Mm. Whether you're Sunni or Shia, there is no doubting the knowledge of Imam al Baqir and Imam al Sadiq. They said that this refers to us, the Imams of Al Muhammad. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made our obedience obligatory in the same way as he made obligatory the obedience of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. You find therefore that obeying and believing and following the Imams is a connection to obeying, following and believing in the Holy Prophet peace be upon his family. And that obedience to them is obligatory. Now, in Shia thought, we believe the Prophet Muhammad is infallible, let's say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, infallible, do you agree? Of course. Now, when we come towards whoever these group of people are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds them in a high position. Because these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making clear for all of us. Obedience to them is the same as obeying Rasulullah. That means they can never err. Because I've made it obligatory upon you to blindly obey them. That's how high they are in my eyes. Higher than the rabbis and the priests of the children of Israel, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Surah Tawbah says, why do you take your rabbis and your priests as lords besides God? 
Normally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want blind imitation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to question the rabbi, to question the priests. But why is it when it comes to, for example, this particular group of people is saying obedience to them is the same as obedience to Rasulullah. And obedience to Rasulullah is obedience to me. And if you differ over something, you people who I've asked to obey me, obey Rasulullah and obey those in authority, you differ over something, return it back to Allah's Prophet. Someone says, why not return it back to Allah, His Prophet and the Ulil Amr? Because the Ulil Amr can never contradict Rasulullah. So you return it back to Allah and His Prophet. Ulil Amr, according to Imam Al-Baqir and Imam Al-Sadiq salam And remember, I'm using my books. I don't need to use anyone else's books. I'm not going to use the random book of an Afghani here or Persian here or Turk here or Palestinian here. I will use the books that are using Imam Al-Baqir and are using Imam Al-Sadiq They are the people who continue to protect the message of and the knowledge of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Therefore, when someone comes and asks me this question that I want you to show me it textually, which part of Imam? Designation from Allah. We show that Allah in the Quran says, Inni nasi imam. The high lofty rank of Imam, we have shown. But people say, okay, but this is Ibrahim alayhi salam, this is before Rasulullah. Okay, then why is there an eye of the Quran that speaks of a group of people who following them, obeying them, is the same as obedience to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. That means that there are a group of people whose qualities and characteristics are the same. As Rasulullah, and the only difference being that revelation ceases and ends with Rasulullah, they are the ones who continue to protect his message. That's why one definition given about Imam in the school of Ahlul Bayt is a definition in which Rasulullah talks to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, and he mentions, they'll fight you over the interpretation of the Holy Quran in the way they fought me over the revelation of the Holy Quran. The Imam is therefore the protector of the interpretation of the Holy Quran in its true essence and its true meaning at its different layers. Mm. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib remains the only man in Islamic history, the only man in Islamic history. And please remember these points. The only man in the history of the religious Islam who his companions, who later on, sadly, some of them went to a deviated belief. The only man of the companions, who some of the companions called God, could look at all others who were there. Oh, there were many Sahaba. Mm -hmm. But none of them were described as having such greatness that some even worshipped them. Mm -hmm. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib remains... The only personality who has ever said, ask me before you lose me. I defy you to find me a companion of Rasulullah after he passed away, who said, ask me before you lose me. I am aware of the secrets of the heavens as well as the secrets of the earth. I defy you, find me one companion. Who people reached a level where they wanted to worship him. Where the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, I fear if I praise you more, they'll make you like Jesus, son of Mary. Who himself says, ask me before you lose me. And who every Muslim in the world today loves. Yeah. I can name you three, four personalities who 300 million people despise. Mm -hmm. Despise. They hate them. They hate them because of the way they treated the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Ali ibn Abi Talib, whether you're Sunni or you're Shia, you still have to admire him in 2017. In other words... When we are saying that those in authority, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala normally says, Obey Allah, obey the Prophet. Obey Allah, obey the Prophet. Obey Allah, obey the Prophet. In Surah 4 verse 59, wait, let's extend this. And I find it funny that some say, well, no, the Ulil Amr according to Abu Huraira, I'm not interested. The Ulil Amr according to Anas bin Malik doesn't interest me. You want to follow Abu Huraira, you want to follow Anas bin Malik, go and follow them. Don't come and ask me about my beliefs when the whole epistemological base of your beliefs is on a group of companions who you admire who I don't have any reverence for at all. Now when I say this, I don't say it in a way where I want to belittle anyone from the Muslim community. Everyone's entitled to their 
conclusions. The early Muslim community, the Mu'tazila said one thing, the Asha'ara said one another thing, the Ja'fariya said another thing, schools of fiqh, schools of law developed, people were debating each other. But the epistemological worldview that I have, I take my understanding of a concept like Imama, I've got the Ahlul Bayt to provide me with the best of answers. Yeah. So I guess Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you previously mentioned, has never left this world without a guide. And the Prophet, as you previously also mentioned, wouldn't leave us without a guide for us to strive for our salvation. Now, given that these Imams are needed for our salvation, why are they not explicitly named in the Quran? Well, first and foremost, how many Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it into the Quran? Of the 124,000. Of 124,000. What is the Quran? A day-by-day a, a -day manual of what's going to happen in this world? 25 prophets made it out of 124,000. Do you believe in 124,000 prophets? Yourself? Of course. Do Muslims believe in 124,000 prophets? Of course. Where is it written in the Quran that we have to believe in 124,000 prophets? Because everyone keeps telling me, why is their names not mentioned? Why is the number not mentioned? I bet that was one of your questions coming up. Why is the number not mentioned? Sorry, 124,000 prophets. I've never seen one ayah that says there's 124,000 prophets. Have you? I haven't. But we all believe in 124,000 prophets, don't we? I've seen 25 prophets mentioned in the Quran. I'm sure there's a lovely prophet in India. Where's he? I'm sure there was a nice prophet in China. Love to meet him. Nothing. It's all this group of Middle Eastern prophets. Mm. I find it interesting that even if their names had been mentioned, I wonder whether that could have been an excuse for later empires to start naming their kids with those names and say this was the person who was spoken about in the Quran. Mm. I also find it, find it interesting whether when Nabi Nuh was a prophet, he had mentioned all the names of every single prophet to come at the end of time and say there is... This many prophets after me, here's all their names. Furthermore, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, once I understand his seerah, and remember, not the seerah which Abu Huraira or Anas or any of those wrote, seerah of Imam al-Baqir, Imam al-Sadiq, Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, has made it clear to his companions who his successor is and has made it clear. So it's not just a matter of someone saying to me, show me an eye of the Quran for this issue. Believe you me, there are certain principles that have to be believed in in other schools in Islam. They can't find an ayah for them in the Quran. They go to the hadith. There are certain principles of theology that they take from seerah, not from the Quran. So why is it that you can take a principle of theology from the seerah of Rasulullah and I can't take a principle in the names of the Imams, or the number of the Imams from the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But my understanding of the seerah comes from Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salam. So you mentioned, obviously, from the, the narrations of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, that we can look at those narrations and derive imamat from there. So, obviously, we can use hadiths as proof. How can we use them as proof? How do we know if a hadith is authentic or not? Well, once again, when we're looking at our traditions, we're looking at the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, there's an interesting point. Do they ever say that they are the Imams chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You see something interesting today when, on, when I hear people emailing me or read people's emails and they're saying to me, people are asking us prove Imama. The onus is not on me to prove my belief. Shi'ism is a very early theology. I would say and I will not hesitate to say this, and you can show this wherever you want, on every link, on YouTube, wherever you want. Shi'ism, the Khawarij, and the Murji'ah are the three earliest theologies in Islam. There was no such thing as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. I defy anyone. I defy anyone to show me that there's a clear, crystallized creed, clear, crystallized creed, three C's, that was there in early Islam called Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. If not, you can show me 200, 300 years later, I don't mind. Early Islam, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Shi'ism was definitely early theology. You can look at the early battles of Islam, the companions of Ali ibn Abi Talib are talking of the religion of Ali, and that they are the Shi'at of Ali. 
and that there is a distinct Shi'i legal school in Kufa very early on who are distinguished by the fact they rub, they wipe their feet, they don't wash their feet. Who are distinguished by the fact that they read Qunut as a mustahab act in Salah. Najm Haidar has a fantastic work on this. I recommend the viewers to read it. Where he looks at the early origins of the Shia in Kufa. It's available on Amazon. It's a fantastic piece which shows Shi'ism as a very early theology. When I say an early theology, I mean... That the principles of Shi'i Islam were already entrenched, entrenched early in the community. An Imam that is designated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is infallible, and all of these, of course, require definitions, and that has knowledge inherited from Rasulullah as well as has access. To inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that can be seen as a distinct early school. The Khawarij are an earlier distinct theological school than Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah that you see today originally was a theological school called the Murji'ah. That's prototype Ahlul Sunnah. Ahlul Sunnah in the early days, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, there's no such early clear creed. There's still major debates concerning the predestination of free will. There's debates about the, uh, whether the Qur'an is eternal or the Qur'an is created. About how much obedience you give to those in authority. With the Umayyad Abbasid schisms. There's no Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah early on. So when today someone's telling me, come prove to me this belief. I'll say, why is the onus on me to prove? I'm early and distinct. You prove to me what your clear theological belief is. And even you'll begin to notice that many in Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah will say to you that you Shia believe in this concept of Imamat that came after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi died and that Islam had been completed with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Even though we believe that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had already spoken of the Imams before he died. Therefore, it's, Imam it does not become a political issue. It's a theological clear belief. But they say to us that those who come after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa there's no such thing as taking them as authority. Please understand this delicate point. After Rasulullah died, you don't take anyone's authority. You take Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Quran. I ask you, I want to tell you something. I'm Sunni. I'm Sunni. Today I'm Sunni. I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prophets, the Quran, the angels, and the day of judgment. Am I Sunni? Yes, I am. Yes. But I don't agree with the first caliph, the second caliph, the third caliph, and Aisha because of their behavior towards Rasulullah. Am I still Sunni? No. If Islam is believing in Allah, the Prophet, the Day of Judgment, the Quran, the angels, is what makes me a Muslim and a member of Ahl Sunnah, then no one should be concerned what my opinions are about the Sahaba or Aisha because they all came after Rasulullah in their authority positions as caliphs or the battles that they may have led. But you'll find today, I'm told, that for you to be Sunni, you also have to show full admiration to the concept of Adalat al-Sahaba, the complete decency of the Sahaba, and must show ultimate respect and never question the wives of Rasulullah to a level where you dissociate from them. Now, I thought you said after Rasulullah died, there is no more authority and no more need mm -hmm. to have any more clear lines about belief. Now you're telling me that I believe in 12 Imams who you say you have a problem with because of their infallibility. You've made 100,000 Sahaba infallible and I can't say a single word about them. And the moment I do say anything about them, they say you don't respect the Sahaba whatsoever. If Islam is completed with a belief in Allah, in the Prophets, in the Quran, in the Day of Judgment, and in the angels, and we don't debate anything after that, that's all you need to be a Muslim, 
Yes, if that is all, according to Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that means that I can be Sunni by dissociating from the Sahaba and from Aisha, the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Straight away someone says, no you can't, you must, I said, hold on, hold on, you said to me, Islam finished with Rasulullah, why are you concerned about the wives and the Sahaba? Part of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah's creed later became, and this is what's interesting, they say Imama was never part of the original creed of Islam. Ultimate decency of Sahaba was part of the original creed in, of, of, of the religion of Islam. I defy anyone to show me an eye of the Quran, because they're very textual, I'm from a rational school, they're very textual. I defy anyone to show me an eye of the Quran, says every single Sahabi never was affected by hypocrisy, never ran away from a battlefield. Never raised his voice above the voice of Rasulullah. Never walked away from Salat al-Jum'ah. Never thought twice about going on jihad. I defy anyone to show me. Wallah, I guarantee you no one can show me a clicker. But you have to believe in it. So when you have a problem with me about Imam saying what's this idea and belief that you guys have about Imam and so on. You give one impression to the people that enough for them is to believe in Allah, the Prophet, the angels, the day of judgment. The moment anyone touches a question mark on what came after Rasulullah, you suddenly have made that part of your creed. And that's why. Read any of the creeds of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. When I see these people trying to bully some of our youth mm. by trying to say to them that, prove to me this, prove to me that. What do you mean prove to me this and that? Look at your own creed. Firstly, your creed is not early. Secondly, not only is it not early, it comes later on with a new mishmash of ideas where some schools believe in predestination, others believe in free will. There's bickering and disputes. Ash'ari was a Mu'tazali. He now became and formed a school called the Ash'ara. Different uh, legal schools, Abu Hanifa, Malik, Ash-Shafi'i, Ahmed bin Hanbal, with God knows how many legal differences. And, to, and on top of that, there's a new conception called the ultimate decency of the Sahaba of Rasulullah. What is it? You must revere the first four Khulafa and then the other six who are granted paradise. And you must revere all of the Sahaba and the Muhajirs and so on. Hold on, where did that come in? If you're telling me Imama is something that has come post, where did this come in? The ultimate decency of the Sahaba. Therefore, when you come and question 12 of my Imams, don't forget that you made 100,000 people infallible with no one allowed to say a single word about them. And don't forget that that came in your creed and the likes of Tahawi and others which came with later creeds. Wasn't an early creed. So please, for those who are out there, don't get bullied into no position where they tell you that you know what, prove this, prove this. The onus is on you to prove that you were a school in early Islam. For me... I have a clear, distinct school in early Islam. Even beautifully, once you've I've heard from your lectures, learned, learned from you, when you've said, uh, again, going back to the thought of rationality, you know, how can one rightly guided person go to war against another rightly guided person? And where's the logic in these two rightly guided people fighting each other? So out of the two, who is rightly guided in the end? Thank you very much, Sayyidina. Uh, dear respected brothers and sisters, inshallah we'll be taking a short break. Uh, for the second part of the show, we'll be taking your questions live. You can get in contact with us via the number on the screen or sending in your message via Facebook or WhatsApp. Uh, we look to join you soon again. Thank you very much. Dear respected brothers and sisters, welcome to part two of Live in London with Dr. Said Amman Akshwani, where tonight we're looking at the topic of Imamat, inshallah. Uh, Sayyidna, following on from our conversation before the break, uh, I'm really interested to know what the difference is between messengers and Imams. Well, the, the, the clear difference is on the matter of revelation. Uh, these messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would receive revelations. Uh, with the angel Gabriel, for example, visiting them with the revelation from the Lord of the heavens and the earth. But that stops with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. Does that mean an angel cannot come and visit an imam? Of course they can. But revelation has ended with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. An angel like Jibrail can come and visit an imam. If someone says angels only visit prophets, no they don't. 
In the Quran, the angel Gabriel visited Maryam Likewise, you find that in the famous hadith, Ali, you are to me like Aaron was to Moses, except that there is no prophet after me. So Ali ibn Abi Talib had that distinct closeness to Rasulullah except that there is no prophet. The seal of the prophets is the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. The revelation ends with him. So I guess in Shi'i theology especially, is, is a prophet higher than Imam or vice versa? There are a number of opinions on this issue. But I can definitely rationally and textually understand that the Imams are higher than all the prophets except the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. Now someone out there is going to point out a couple of differing opinions and I can definitely agree. But I can also see rationally as well as textually why this can be understood. Let me explain. First and foremost you find these prophets, especially let's say the Ul al Azam prophets, Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, all of them are great prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're great messengers. Do you agree their sharia is now void? Of course, Correct. the prophet has come. I can only use something from their sharia if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam points to it. While they are great messengers, their sharia has ended. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided that the man whose sharia will be the final sharia for mankind would be Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That means those designated to be his successors out of all of Allah's creations must be the greatest of humans after that man. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala found them as being worthy to be the protectors of the interpretation of that message the way Rasulullah was worthy and chosen to be the protector of the revelation of that message. That's from a rational understanding. If you look at different traditions you'll find it's not unusual for the Holy Prophet peace be upon his time, to have mentioned the ulama of my ummah are greater than the prophets of the children of Israel. Prophets are great. The ulama of my ummah, the scholars of my ummah are greater than the uh, prophets of the children of Israel. Now that refers to the imams of Ahl al-Bayt Thirdly, we have traditions which mention that the Mahdi will lead Nabi Isa, Prophet Jesus السلام, in prayer. It's not bringing down from Nabi Isa's position. Nabi Isa, without him you could not understand God. Mm. Nabi Isa is an arch prophet of God. His sharia has now ceased to exist. When he comes an imam will lead him in prayer. prayer. Therefore there are different ways in which a person is able to understand why imamat is higher than prophethood except Rasulullah Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I'm one of the slaves of the slaves of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, none is like him. He is the greatest creation of God. However, he himself says in many traditions, me and Ali are created from one light. Ali is the nafs of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, as per the eye of Mubahala and the incident of Mubahala. So therefore, for someone to say that the Imams are higher than the Prophets, Except Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is not something unusual. And the Imams point to this. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. Remember we said we want to discuss Imam we discuss from the beacons of knowledge. Not from ex-pagans and Bedouins. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam mentions wonderfully. In his discussion of Asif bin Barkhiya. the successor of Nabi Sulaiman who was able to bring the Queen of Sheba's throne in, in, in Surah 27 from verse 30 onwards. Now you know if I ask you now, I've forgotten my laptop in Sydney, Australia. I forgot my laptop in New York. Can you just, I want it here right now. You're going to say to me, Sayyidina, let's go to U UPS, let's go to a courier service, FedEx, three days, two days, emergency. Imagine one of the jinn replies to Sulaiman by saying, I'll bring, I'll bring it to you before you get up from your place. Let's say he used to go to work, let's say from 9 a.m. to 12 mm -hmm. midday. He says, so before you get up, I'll bring it to you. Then there was someone who had some knowledge of the book. Some knowledge bestowed upon him from Allah SWT, who said, I'll bring it to you before you blink. It was there. 
Asif bin Barkhiya is the successor, a wasi of a prophet of God. And he was able to bring the queen of Sheba's throne before Sulaiman blinked. Mm -hmm. Imam al-Baqir mentions, if Allah's knowledge is divided into 73 portions, one out, one out of those 73, two out of the 73 is given to Asif bin Barkhiya. He says the Imams of Al Muhammad have been given 72 out of 73 portions of the knowledge of Allah SWT. Given, given the knowledge of an Imam is not independent. It's dependent on what Allah decides to give. When today someone asks me, your Imams have knowledge of the unseen? I say, well, do you agree prophets have knowledge of the unseen? Surah 72 verse 26 to 27, عَالِمُ الْغَيْبِ فَلَا يُظْهِرُ عَلَىٰ إِلَّا مَنْ ارْتَضَى مِنْ رَسُولٍ The Quran says that Allah has knowledge of the unseen. He doesn't reveal it to anyone except of His messengers who He chooses. Do you agree that Allah decides to give knowledge of the unseen to some of His messengers? Likewise. In Ayat al-Kursi, وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءٍ There are chosen people Allah decides to give some knowledge to. An Imam cannot have ilm al-ghayb independently. He has to rely on what Allah decides to give. But Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq mention 72 portions given to Al Muhammad out of the 73. So therefore when you're coming to understand the position of the Imams of al bayt they themselves attest to their position. Another thing that we hear often that the Imams are given or a status that they have attained is, is this theory of infallibility or their isma. Would you mind elaborating a little bit on what infallibility actually is, what it means that they have? There's different definitions of infallibility. Firstly, again, let's go back to rational, aqli and naqli. The fact that Allah has ordered me to obey them Rationally means they must be infallible. Because I can't obey the sinner. Of course. Secondly, the fact that Allah put them in that position to protect the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa must mean that they're infallible in the area of tabligh, not just the area of sin. They are infallible in the sense that they like us, can commit sin but choose not to. The Qudra is there. They're not robots walking on the earth. Mm -hmm. They can commit a sin, but they choose not to. I remember Imam Zain al-Abidin someone says to him, when you say that you are ma'soom, when you say you're infallible, again, the Ahl al-Bayt make it clear that they are ma'soom. When you say that you are ma'soom, does that mean that you can't commit a sin? He says, no, we can, but we choose not to. We can, but we wouldn't. He said, what do you mean? He said, if I asked you to walk in the street naked, can you? He said, yes. He said, would you? He said, no. He said, why? He said, because of the people that's watching us. He goes, likewise with us, we can commit a sin, but we choose not to because of the respect of the Lord that's watching us. Infallibility. According to the definitions given by the, the theologians, such as Sheikh Al-Mufid, Allam Al-Hilli, they talk of a grace which God pours upon His servant who's already displayed a wonderful obedience to Him. This, this, this grace is a grace which purifies them as well as ensures they'll never order you to commit wrong or to mit commit a mistake. Because when I have to obey that person in authority, it is upon the idea that that person is always a source of guidance to Allah. Why don't I obey someone who's fallible? Because whatever he says to me, I'll still say I'm going to hear someone else's opinion, true? Mm. Today, with a scholar in fiqh, even if he gives you an opinion, don't you say, well, let me read what other marajah say on the issue, what other scholars say on the issue. We don't want a tasalsul to occur where I jump from person to person to person to person. That person Allah has designated, the beauty of his designation is that I know, number one, when he orders something, that order comes from 
the knowledge of prophets before him and the mystical light of Ibrahim bestowed in his loins. And number two, that I know anyone who fights him on any day, I know where Haq will always be. I won't be confused saying Salah is good with Ali and food is good with Muawiyah and the middle is good for whoever. No, I'll know where I'm heading. I know where I am. Therefore, infallibility is that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt rationally, because they are to be obeyed, means they have to be error free. Likewise, we recognize they will never ever, because they are to be obeyed, order us to do anything bad. It's always towards good. Otherwise, I can pick someone else. Their opinion matters as much as yours. But when I know you are ma'soom, I know that you can only give me good. You can never give me your opinion. How many times do you hear the line in Islamic history? He done his ijtihad, but he made a mistake. So they made up this new theory that if you do ijtihad, make a mistake, you get one reward. If you do ijtihad and you're right, you get double the reward, let's say. No, we say that the Imam of Ahlul Bayt, السلام, there's no such thing as them coming out with their own opinions. Their opinion is the opinion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And hence why their obedience is the obedience of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Therefore, when it comes to infallibility, two areas. Infallible in the way they disseminate knowledge and the message and infallible away from any of the impurities that can affect me and you. So I guess given their status, their infallibility, their levels of knowledge, a lot of them talked about the Mahdi that you touched upon earlier. Uh, we believe in the Ghaybat and also the Mahdi, Jalallahu Ta'ala Faraj Sharif. What makes our beliefs right as opposed to the other sects who also believe in the same or similar things? Well, I think first let's define Imama, and we defined Imama by saying those who are designated by Allah, those who have the greatest ilm of all the people that surround them. And what else did we say? And we also spoke about those who are infallible. Now, I can't disagree with you. There were others who came and said that they have a Mahdi. Others who spoke of a Ghaiba. But once we've defined Imama, then we can begin to see that those who you've claimed are this savior or guide for mankind. Compare him to the Imam who was living in his time. And see the difference in the knowledge between them. See who came out to be a fraud and who came out to be truly a person of knowledge. Compare who came out to be a sinner and who's the one who had the best of reputations. So in other words, I can't come to other schools and say that I'm forcing you to believe in my Mahdi, not yours. No, but when I come to define Imama and when I come to the areas of knowledge and infallibility, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, there is not a blemish on their book from other schools of Islam. If you look at other schools of Islam and contemporaries of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, you'll find that they revere the Imams a reverence where they talk of their physical and spiritual purity at all times. When it comes therefore towards the Ghayba as well, we have our clear-cut evidences of the Ghayba of the 12th Imam of Al Muhammad. And it's interesting, earlier you were asking me about 12 you find in Sunni books, Sunni famous texts such as Bukhari and Muslim, there will be 12 after me, whether they are Amirs or Naqibs or Khalifs. That number 12 is often repeated. It's repeated that Moses had 12 disciples. Jesus had 12 disciples. And I find it so interesting when people say to us, name us your, you know, prove to us your Imams. I tell them in 1,400 years of your history, give me the names of 12 good leaders. You who are asking me about my 12 Imams, give me the name of 12 good leaders in 1,400 years. Wallah, they always struggle up to about six or seven, then they don't know what they're talking about. After all, they start bringing wishy-washy names from here and there. So, with us, you can find that subhanallah, even towards the time of the birth of the 12th of Al-Muhammad, they're putting his parents under house arrest in Samarra when the Abbasids moved the government to Samarra. <clears throat> Already there is an understanding of a theological group called the Rafidah in the time of Imam Al-Hadi alayhi salam. So there are many different ways in which we can prove the concept of occultation, the concept of the Mahdi, as well as the birth of the Mahdi. My 
former supervisor for my master's degree, Dr. Jassim Hussein, has written a wonderful work, The Occultation of the Twelfth Imam, where he shows the belief in the Mahdi was not something that came after the Twelfth Imam, but rather from the Sixth Imam onwards, there's already discussions about an underground movement preparing for the birth of the Mahdi. So given we've gone into this much detail around the Muhammad, their infallibility, characteristics, the rational, textual proofs, it leaves me wondering if a person can be Muslim if they don't believe in Imamat. How, what would your opinion be on that, Sayyidina? Well, if you're looking Quranically, a Muslim at its most basic, basic level is he who believes in God and the Day of Judgment. That's of those who submit to Allah. Then after that, there are verses about those who believe in God, the prophets, and the day of judgment. And that's why when you're coming towards any Muslim in Shi'i thought, we say, anyone who utters the phrase, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad, anyone who utters that phrase, that's it, he is a Muslim. You want to talk about traversing the heights and the paths to reaching the levels of Iman, and the higher levels of Iman, where you recognize the path of those who are the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that would require a person to hold on to the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt salam, as the thaqalain. Now there are people out there who know about Imama and decide to reject it. Their destiny is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are others who don't know a single thing about Imama. Believe you me, there are people out there who don't know who, who Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq is. They don't know who Imam al-Rada is. I met members from Ahl al-Sunnah who say they love Ahl al-Bayt. Ask him, who's Imam al-Jawad? He doesn't know. His conception of Ahl al-Bayt is Ali, Fatima, Hassan, Hussein. And that's it. Then after that, Imam al-Jawad, Imam al-Hadi hasn't got a clue who these people are. There are many out there who do not know about the greatness of the Imams of Al-Muhammad and their position. And there are many who assume when they say to us, prove to us Imama. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he talks about himself, you read in Al-Kafi the way Imam Ali السلام, describes his position as Imam or the way Imam al-Sadiq describes his position as Imam. There are many out there who don't know any of this. There are many who are Hanafi, they don't know Imam al-Sadiq was the teacher of Abu Hanifa. There are many who are Malik, you don't know anything about Malik's praise of Imam al-Sadiq. There are many who know Ahmed bin Hanbal but don't know anything about Imam al-Rad So, basis to be a Muslim, believing in Allah, believing in the Prophet, the Day of Judgment for example is basic prerequisites. But to reach complete Iman, you find many of the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt mentioning, pray as much as you want, but without understanding our authority, a person will never understand the real essence of worship. And there are many traditions along those lines. Believe you me, the school of Ahl al-Bayt, you want to find spirituality, law, theology and ethics, Shia Islam. If you want a political mishmash of ideas that develops into theological and legal schools of random individuals, there are other schools of Islam you could follow. I guess going on the topic of following, um... We have a lot of different sects that have arisen. Some believe in four imams, some believe in six, eight, seven, twelve, eleven, ten, etc. Did this arise from companions of the imams at the time not knowing who the imam actually was, or are there sort of different reasons for these? I think there's many different reasons. I think I think what's firstly clear, Sheikh Al Mufid and the Irshad has some wonderful narrations clearly highlighting that there are companions of imams who straight away know who the Imam who is designated after that Imam is. Uh, so for those out there to say a lot of the companions didn't know, Shaykh Al-Mufid and the Irshad mentions, these people would come to visit the Imam and they would come and recognize him as the Imam who was designated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also mentioned to them by the previous Imam. That was really normally what most were privy to be able to achieve. Secondly, there are those who some say didn't know the Imam of their time. Well, in some cases they were far away from where that Imam was, who was now the Imam of their time and were not able to go and visit him or to talk to him. In other cases they may have died before they were able to see the Imam of their time. Other cases there is uh, personal reasons why people decide to follow an Imam different from the one who's designated. Some are financial reasons, others are reasons related to power. 
It's a whole host of different reasons. Fourthly, sometimes the amount of um, oppression that that particular imam is facing means he cannot openly tell the people who his successor is because whoever that per the people find out is the successor will be beheaded. I remember Imam Sadiq when he lists five names. Remember Mansour al-Dawaniq asks his governor in Medina, look for the will of Ja'far al-Sadiq, find out who his successor is and behead him. Imam al-Sadiq came, he took his will. When he read the names on the will, the first one, Mansour al-Dawaniq, the caliph. The second one, the governor. Third one, Musa al-Kadhim. Fourth one, uh, Abdullah. The fifth one, you know, they mentioned a number of names. So you find that it was difficult for the Imam to openly come out. But does that mean because he's not openly come out and said who the Imam is after him, does that mean that the people don't know just because it's not being public? No, there are companions who clearly know. There are those close confidants who clearly know who the Imam is who has been designated. Yes, I'm not going to deny there are some who may have believed in a concept of Imama where the eldest son is the one who's meant to be the Imam and therefore they sided towards that direction. What's clear is that in that early uh, Muslim community, the idea that authority belongs to Ahl al-Bayt can be seen in, in the masses. You know, the Abbasids used that slogan to get into power. It highlights that people recognize authority belongs to Al Muhammad sallallahu after they've tried every single possible method of authority. You know, they tried with the Saqifah election. They tried with Abu Bakr choosing Umar. They tried with the Shura of six people for Uthman. They tried with the whole community coming together. They tried with an Umayyad coup. They done an Abbasid revolution. People tried absolutely everything. And one thing they concluded is authority belongs to Ahl al-Bayt So there's many different reasons why, for example, there may be some who went towards a particular direction. And that in itself requires a lot more analysis. Inshallah. Uh, Sayyidna, moving on to some of our questions from tonight. Uh, this one is from Brother Jafar. Uh, he says he's been for a Shia for almost four years uh, living in Serbia. Uh, he wants to ask uh, how could he make his family Shia uh, because at the moment they are Sufi Tariqati. If they're Sufi Tariqati, then they have an inclination towards Ahl al-Bayt because Virtually 99.9% .9 of Sufis out there will one way or the other return back towards the Ahl al-Bayt and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Um, so therefore they already have a connection to the Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam as long as they hold on to the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt and the Quran that insha'Allah will be something which is uh, a sufficient step towards them gaining more and more knowledge about the Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam. Uh, another question, Sayyidna, from Camille from the Reunion Island. Uh, can we consider that to some extent we are superior to Imams in general as they led a rightful life, but they've seen the other side, so for example, Jahannam, Jannah, there is no place in their minds for doubt. Uh, but as for us, we try to lead as much of a rightful life as we can without any kind of actual proof apart from our inner faith. Well, it's certainly a, a very high position for a person to reach where they believe in the Imam of their time without having actually met him. That's a very high position to reach. Imam al Salih says the companions of the Mahdi are the greatest because they believe in an Imam who they cannot see in contrast to others who had met the Imams of their time. But when it comes to the Imams of their time, one word which is always repeated in theological texts about, uh, especially in the, in the context of infallibility, is the word Qudra. The Imam is not a robot. When the six-month-old baby dies in the arms of Imam al Hussein, he feels the same pain that you feel. When he sees his brother's arms cut, he feels what you feel. Therefore, don't imagine him as a robot mm -hmm. on the 10th of Muharram. And don't imagine them as robots when it comes to their infallibility. The Qudra is there to sin, but that unbelievable cognizance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what keeps them away from that sin. So when a person says, are we superior? Uh, can we be seen superior? Never. Never. And especially what the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt knew and what they held on to in the midst of adversity, in the midst of oppression, is something for all of us to look up to. Inshallah. So you now we have a caller on the line. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, respected caller. Please could you share your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum. Yes, brother. Um, thank you for the very uh, informative lecture about Imam. Um, my question is, 
when we discuss our debate with Sunnis about Imamat, there is strong evidence about Imamat in Hadith Kisa from Imam Ali to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. As you mentioned earlier that in some ayah in the Quran refer to Imamat, can you please give us some ayah or ayahs that refers clearly or indicates clearly about Imamat after Imam Hussein alayhi salam? Thank you very much. Once again, question. my dear brother, we said that those who are telling you, show me a clear ayah in the Quran, we said that the first basis we always use to understand imamat is a rational base. Mm. Secondly, we showed the clear ayah in the Quran, Surah 4, verse number 59. And that uh, Surah 4, verse 59 says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasoola wa ulil amri minkum. Obey Allah, obey the Prophet, and obey those in authority from you. I don't think those in authority from you gives us an indication that that just goes up to Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam. Mm. And that's why you find the Imams of Ahlul Bayt making it clear that this refers to us, the 12 Imams of Al Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And you can find this in the tafsir works where the Imams refer to this particular ayah. Likewise, as we mentioned, you find that, let's say, of the usul al arbaamiya the 400 usul, of Imam al-Sadiq you still have about between 13 to 16 that are manuscripts that exist in, in, in Iran currently and there is a mention there of the students of Imam al-Sadiq discussing the 12, uh, 12 Imams of Ahlul Bayt So when someone's asking me, show me that ayah from the Quran, yes, if you want the ayah with the tafsir, then the tafsir of Ul al-Amr refers to the 12 Imams of Ahlul Bayt Again, as we mentioned, when it comes to the number 12, firstly, the 12ers are the only school that are able to name 12. Other schools stop at 4, some go to 7, others mention 6 Khulafa, no one's able to get to 12. And secondly, in the books of Ahl Sunnah, it says there will be 12 Khulafa after me. So therefore, it's not only referring to us, there are also evidences within the books of Ahl Sunnah that are mentioned. Inshallah. Thank you very much, Sayyidina. Uh, another question, Sayyidina, is uh, a lot of people are asking, what is wilaya and what is imamat? Are they both the same thing? Is there a difference between the two? Uh, do you need to have one and not the other? Or do you need to have both? Or what's the situation there? If you'd Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we find that refers to himself as the guardian of all the believers. Mm -hmm. That is what we know as wilaya am. Many times we've recited the ayah, Allah wali alladheena amanu yukhrijuhum min al-dhulumat ila al-nur. Allah is the guardian of those who believe. He takes them out of the depths of darkness into light. There are many darknesses, hence dhulumat, but nur is one. This wilaya, this guardianship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in its general concept can be seen in such an ayah. But then from amma it becomes khasa. How does it become khasa? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides that my guardianship of creation, I'm going to give it to some of my chosen creation. So in Surah 5 verse 55, Allah says, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُكُمْ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُ Allah is your guardian and his Rasul. Now that guardianship, which originally is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now is transferred to who? To the Prophet. Does it stop there? Your guardian is Allah, you, O oh people. Your guardian is Allah and His Prophet. And those who believe, but can't be all those who believe, because He's saying, Your guardian, the come here referring to your guardian, is all of you. That doesn't make any sense. It must be one particular, for example, person who's doing something. Those who establish salah and give away zakat while they are in a state of ruku'ah. Again, I don't need to go to Anas or Abu Huraira or any of these people telling me, well, that's not the tafsir. I go to Imam al-Baqir, Imam al-Sadiq, saying this ayah is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transferred his guardianship of all of the creation to the Prophet and to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Therefore, when you're looking at wilaya and imama, it is the guardianship of the creation of Allah from a designation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
That is the meaning of wilaya. Sometimes you hear the word wilaya and wilaya. Wilaya is that bond of affection and camaraderie that exists between the lovers of Ahlul Bayt Wilaya is Allah's general authority which is now transferred to the Prophet and to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt yeah. uh, We have another caller on the line saying uh, Assalamu Alaikum Assalamu Alaikum, can you hear us? Oh, we've lost the, the connection Sayyidina uh, another question that's come in is uh, this person's written, uh, I've heard a rumor that uh, Allah chose the Prophet by mistake and he was meant to choose Ali. And this is a, a, a common belief amongst uh, you, your sect. Can you please uh, shed some light on this? Yes, yeah, the biggest load of nonsense I've ever heard, but it's been spread very well. So whoever's the, you know, the propaganda machine has really done well. Um, I got a feeling which country has made sure that it's spread everywhere, but... What it is, is that people say that, you know, we believe that Gabriel made a mistake. He went to the wrong person. He should have gone to Ali. If ever there was a group who believed in such a thing, let's say 0.000001% of them existed in some medieval century, uh, you know, on, let's say, the mountains of a particular part of Europe or something, they certainly have got nothing to do with Shia belief. You want our beliefs? Go to Sheikh al-Sadur, go to Sheikh al-Mufid, go to Allam al-Halli. Khawaja Nasuddin al-Tawsi, amongst others who have discussed what is the meaning of the position of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt within theological texts. Mm, inshallah. Uh, another question here from Brother Amir Reza in London. It says, if Islam was completed during the time of Prophet Muhammad, then what is the role of the Imams afterwards? Great question. The role of the Imam is to provide protection for the interpretation of the Quran in the way Rasulullah provided protection for the revelation of the Holy Quran. The knowledge of the internal and the external, the inner and the deeper meaning of the Quran, the abrogations and the abrogated, the reasons for revelation, when they were revealed, why they were revealed, towards whom they were revealed, where they were revealed, all of this knowledge is with Ahlul Bayt and that's the role of the Imams to protect the message of the religion of Islam and the knowledge that was left behind by Rasulullah Why would the Holy Prophet say, I'm the city of knowledge and Ali is its gate? Why would the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family in his farewell sermon at Ghadir, in Sahih Muslim it clearly mentions the word Ghadir. You can go on Google and search it. Sahih Muslim in the search engine type Ghadir, you will see that the Prophet stopped at a valley called Khum. That's what's mentioned. A valley called Khum. An oasis is Ghadir. The valley is called Khum. If you type Khum in Sahih Muslim. And he said, I leave behind for you the Quran and my Ahlul Bayt. The Quran being next to the Ahlul Bayt is interesting. The Quran is the word of God written. Ahlul Bayt are the walking word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran is God's chosen book. Ahlul Bayt are God's chosen leaders for mankind. The Quran is infallible. Al Muhammad are infallible. So the Imam, his role, is to protect the legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Is he, Rasulullah, the only prophet who had 12? No, Moses had 12, Jesus had 12. And with the, it being the final sharia, at such a young religion, rationally, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not have 12 who protect that message? Inshallah. Uh, I guess a final question selfishly from myself, given that we're on the topic of uh, imamah to end the show with. We have a responsibility towards our 12th Imam, may Allah fasten his reappearance. What is the best way in your opinion that we can get to know him or aid him or serve him? What are some things we can do to become closer with him and develop that connection with him so that he can become our salvation? I, I think a couple of things. Firstly, in the ziyarah of the Imam, we say, Assalamu alayka ya sahab al-asr wa zaman Assalamu alayka ya khalifat al-Rahman. Assalamu alayka ya sharik al-Qur'an. Peace be upon you, O companion, O partner of the Qur'an. Let's build our relationship with the Holy Qur'an. In that way, we'll truly know the Imam of our time and not die the death of a jahil. Mm. Secondly, you want to be with the 12th Imam, try and read about his father and grandfather. There are many who have neglected Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari. So let's try and build a relationship with them, inshallah. Inshallah. 
as always, thank you very thank much, you so much for your time today. You. My very, pleasure. Very thank insightful you. evening once again. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you to our respected brothers and sisters for tuning in. Inshallah, our next show will be on Monday night, beginning again at the time of 10 p.m. For the first part of the show, we'll be discussing another chosen topic. And for the second part, we'll be answering your questions, be it via the live call or Facebook or WhatsApp. As always, please keep us in your du'as. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.